I think everyone's back in the chat now, so we can get started with our rapid fire session. Um, so if Anna is around, Anna Bio, Bio I could yeah. ask to, great, um, if you get your presentation set up. Yep. So just to give a quick couple of um, seconds of an introduction before you get started. So these are fast talks, so it's three minutes per speaker and then two minutes um, for questions. Um, if you guys have any questions that you want to ask any of the speakers, we will have some time at the end where there's a short break where you can ask them if you don't get a chance during the actual presentations. But otherwise, I think if all the presenters could just have their presentations ready to go, um, I think we're ready to to hear Anna tell us a little bit about modeling partially migratory metapopulation dynamics um, in the context of global climate change. Okay, let me share my screen and yes. see how that works. Uh, whoop, not like that, sorry. Uh, are you seeing my screen? It's not the presentation yes. mode, but... Yeah, no, we can see it. Okay. So, um, uh, sorry about this. Okay. So, so uh, one of the ways that that populations have to deal with climate change is through moving from one place to another, and a, and a way to to move is essentially to migrate, um, and migration allows essentially to to exploit seasonal resources to individuals but also to avoid seasonally harsh conditions and and migration is a widespread phenomenon across taxa i have only put seabirds here but there's many other species that that enact a migration however when you look at migration not all of the individuals are doing the same and some individuals uh, and there's individual heterogeneity in in that phenomenon some individuals are migrants and some individuals are resident and when uh, we are trying to address how how in how populations uh, deal with climate change we need to account for these different behaviors so one way to do that oops uh, one one way to do that is to build seasonally and spatially structured metapopulation matrices that allow to account for that variability in the different in the different groups and uh, would also allow us to assess which are the parameters of the model that are most important. So, for instance, we can evaluate if survival is more important than the amount of individuals that are migrating, or if fractions of the populations are more important than others. So what I have done is that I have developed these uh, matrix models that is spatially explicit uh, uh, and has two different locations for the European SAG. And it allows me to understand what is the importance of migration in, in metapopulation persistence. And we, what, sorry. I lo siento. So, so one of the things ahora, sorry. Um, so when I look at the elasticities, what I can see is that if I compare the importance of survival and migration and the fraction of the and survival during migration and the fraction that actually is moving, what I can see is that during the observed uh, with the observed conditions, they are more or less as important. However, one of the things that we would expect from climate change is that extreme climatic events will increase in frequency and intensity, and uh, this might cause increased uh, propensity of movement in the individual. So if I uh, have an alternative a scenario in which instead of the observed conditions, I have double the observed conditions, you can see how now the adult survival in the different destinations uh, is not as important, and then migration survival becomes really, really important. So this, this work has been developed by several people. It's a, a collaboration between CEH and the University of Aberdeen, and uh, it's a little bit more complex than I presented, but I would be happy to take any, any questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Anna. If anybody has, uh, we have time for like maybe one quick question. So if anyone has something to ask now, we can go ahead. Uh, 
No? OK, um, if it's OK with everyone, then we'll just move on to Davina. If I can just call Davina onto the screen. Yes, good morning, everybody. I'll just quickly start sharing my screen now. Yeah, and great. And everybody can see me, can I see it? Yes, that's perfect. Thank OK, you, brilliant. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Davina, and the main research focus that I have is trying to understand what is a healthy dolphin. So dolphins are exposed to a lot of different stressors. So for example, they are exposed to vessel noise. They're exposed to humans taking pictures of them, so mainly tourism. They're exposed to plastics, and they're also exposed to contaminations. And all of this can have a massive effect on, on their health. So if we, for example, look at foraging disruptions, so there would be less food available, this can have an effect on the physiology. So if there's less energy for them to invest in, in their overall physiology, this can also have an effect on their health. And this can have an impact on survival and reproduction and eventually lead to changes in population dynamics. So if you want to understand what these stressors are or how these stresses are impacting their health, we first need to have a good definition of what a healthy dolphin is. And we don't really have that. So to try to answer this question, I'm part of the HER project. So that's the Atlantic Bottlenose Dolphin Health and Environmental Risk Assessment. Um, so this project looks at a population of dolphins right off the coast of South Carolina, right there in, in Charleston Harbor. And they do physical examinations on dolphins. So here's a picture. Um, so they then classify these animals and either having a normal health or what we call a challenge ecological health. So that's, for example, they have certain inflammation or immune diseases or uh, they just look sick and not healthy. So then a second step they do is they collect blood samples for metabolomics. So for those that don't know what metabolomics are, um, so your DNA is being transcribed into RNA and your RNA is being transcribed, uh, translated sorry, to proteins. That goes through your body, gets metabolized, and the end product, what you have, is what we call metabolomics. So it's a snapshot of what's happening in our metabolism. So this is what we call the metabolic profile of, of all the dolphins that were in the project. So each individual point represents an animal, and the first thing that you can see immediately is that these animals are separating out according to their health class. So the next question we can ask then, well, what exactly is the difference between these two metabolic profiles? So I did something that's called a pathway analysis. So what you do is you take all the all the metabolites and you overlap it with known pathways. So this is the result. So you have the different pathways on the y-axis and you have the minus log 10 p-value and on the x-axis and the significance is indicated by the line. So one of the things you see immediately is that there's lots of pathways related to amino acid metabolism. And these were actually higher in the animals with a um, impaired health. So just a quick take home message from my presentation is that dolphins with a challenged ecological health have higher circulating levels of amino acids and that would su suggest protein, protein breakdown. So they're basically using up their muscles um, for energy more than um, the healthy dolphins. Are there any questions? Thank you. I'll quickly Just stop sharing my screen. That's fine. I have plenty of time. Okay. Brilliant, thank you. We'll just give it another minute to see if there's any questions that are popping up. But again, if anybody thinks of any questions a little bit later down the line, we will have time at the end as well to ask. OK, so we have a question from David. Um, do you want me to read out the question for you or can you can you see the chat, Davina? Sorry, I just un unmuted myself. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, so it's 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 it is pathological. So another thing that we measured in these animals is is the stress hormones. Um, so their stress hormones were, were highly up, well, up higher in, in the animals with a uh, with the ecological health. So one of the side effects of having an increased stress state is they're trying to produce enough glucose for the fight and flight reaction. And one of the ways they can do that is by gluconeogenesis. So that's basically making glucose from, uh, for example, amino acids. 
Um, so we're not quite sure, but we assume that the protein breakdown is basically because these animals are more diseased and therefore also more stressed, and that's just the underlying effect of it. Okay, great. Thank you, Davina. Um, yes, thank I'll you. just call up David next, um, who's going to tell us a little bit about using simulated models in animal social networks. Hi, David. Hi, how's it going? Great. OK, um, I assume you can see this OK, so I'll just get started. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to be talking about two different methods for uh, analysing social network data. So animals engage in social interactions when they form flocks to avoid predators, when they cooperate with each other's young, and when they compete for access to resources such as water or light. So almost all organisms engage in some kind of social interaction. And we can uh, quantify these social interactions in terms of networks, like the two plots in white there on the screen. And then we want to analyze these, these networks. And you have at least two approaches for analyzing networks. So one is controlled permutations, and where you might calculate your effect you're interested in in your observed network, and that's represented by the, the white bar in the, in the density plot on the left. And then you'd uh, randomize your network in some way, say a thousand times, and you'd calculate the same effect in each of these 1,000 randomized networks. And then you could see if your observed effect was in some way more extreme and therefore perhaps interesting compared to your randomized uh, effect sizes. Alternatively, you can fit an exponential random graph model to your network, and this is uh, a technique not too dissimilar from a linear model in that you can fit a series of terms representing individual level traits or dyadic uh, level traits to try and predict the presence or absence of links in your network. But the question is, which of these two approaches is better when you're analysing the kind of data that behavioural ecologists like me can collect? So we have simulated a range of, of realistic network data to evaluate each of these methods. And we counted the rate of false positives. So the, our methods telling us there was an effect in the network when there, uh, in, when there wasn't, and the rate of false negatives. So the network, the method saying there was no effect when in fact there really was one. When looking for an effect of sex, so this is simply a difference between two le a two level categorical variable in the number of connections individuals had in the network. And I'm referring to this as males and females, but it could be any two level categorical variable. And then we added in a confound, which was the presence of assertivity by, by sex to see how this affected our error rates. So assertivity could be positive, so males would interact with males more often, uh, and females with females, or it could be negative, and that males and females prefer to interact and avoid members of the same sex. And we also had no assertivity at all. And what we found in terms of false positives was that, in fact, both methods give a scandalously high error rate. So in some situations, over 40% of our, our model runs told us there was an effect in the network when we knew there wasn't one, because we, we put it in there. And although the averages for the two methods are quite similar, it does appear that the permutations were more consistent, um, so uh, less likely to get a very high or very low failure rate. And both methods performed worse when there was positive assertivity. So when males tended to interact with males and females with females, both me methods were more likely to say there is a difference in the sexes in terms of their number of interactions when in fact there wasn't. Then if we look at false negatives, performance is generally better um, and ERGMs are on average better than permutation. So they're less likely to say there's no effect in the network when in fact there was one. Um, and both uh, methods perform worse when there was negative assertivity. So if, male, if, if opposite sex interactions are more common than same sex interactions, then both uh, methods are more likely to find no effect when there really was an effect in our network. So this work was conducted with Julian Evans, Matthew Silk and the supercomputer Carson. And I'd like to thank you all for listening and I'll gladly take any questions. Great, thank you very much, David. Just wait to see if there's any more questions. Yeah, no worries. Oh, there's um, a question by Patricas, who's on the screen at the moment. Um, so the random graph talk, is it similar to multi-layer um, ML? 
so I'm interested. I'm also interested in multi-layer uh, networks, actually. Um, and I don't know if there are extensions of exponential random graph models to multiple layers. So, so a layer is the idea you might have uh, your organisms interacting in, in one way in, in a, a population, say grooming, and they can also be interacting in a different way in the population, say agonistic interaction. And those are two different layers in your network. Um, I don't know if you can fit exponential random graph models to each of those layers and maybe specify terms going across layers. You can do that in some uh, in stochastic actor oriented models, for example, but they're less well developed than the RGMs, although they have got this dynamic uh, thing. But I think if we can fix how ERGMs perform in terms of that ridiculously high false positive rate, then it will be interesting to see if we can then use them for multi-layer networks. Great. Thank you very much to both of you. Um, can I call up Rufus for our next presentation on accounting fish losses? Uh, right. uh, hopefully you can see my PowerPoint. Yes, that's perfect. Okay, brilliant. Great. Uh, right. Hi. Uh, so I'm a PhD student at uh, Aberdeen. Uh, currently, my primary focus is on monkfish on the northern shelf, which is it's a very high value commercial stock. And as such, it's supported by an annual survey. So to produce uh, absolute stock estimates for this um, for this stock, it requires the estimation of the capture efficiency of the net. Uh, so capture efficiency has kind of three primary components, uh, which are herding, vertical avoidance and escapes under the foot rope of the gear. So um, vertical avoidance has been examined, but it's not really believed to be uh, occurring due to the very kind of benthic nature of, of the monkfish, which sits on the bottom. Uh, horizontal herding has been examined and is believed to occur, although it's believed to be fairly minimal, but it is accounted for in the stock assessment. Um, now, this escapement under the uh, foot rope of the gear um, has been investigated by a couple of trials carried out by Marine Scotland Science, and it's, it's these trials and uh, my analysis of them uh, which I'm, I'm going to briefly discuss. Uh, so these trials uh, use uh, sub-foot rope collection bags to catch the fish that would otherwise be lost under the uh, foot rope of the gear. Uh, so here you can see the, the trawl net, which would travel this way. Uh, this is the collection bag attached to the foot rope here. And this is the, the, the rock hopper, which essentially bounces over the seabed and protects the net. Um, so catches were recorded separately for these two nets. Uh, and essentially what this showed uh, was that there was um, clear kind of length dependency with the smaller fish being most likely to be <clears throat> uh, lost under this foot rope. Uh, so now I'm currently in kind of the, um, the model selection phase of things uh, and I've been uh, modeling the foot rope retention as a probability, uh, sorry, modeling the foot rope retention probability as a, a function of length with an effect of day or night. So I've been doing this with a number of models I've look, been looking at a, a generalized linear model, a Richards model, and a generalized additive model. Uh, initially, I really wanted to do this, uh, look at this with a generalized linear mixed model, which would include uh, the different halls as a random effect. However, uh, the, the small sample sizes for many of the halls that I have uh, meant that this wasn't really um, appropriate. So here you can see it for the, uh, the, the, the GLM and the Richards model with the uh, solid line representing the proportion caught uh, during the day and the dashed line representing the proportion caught at night. And what this is suggesting is that during the day, uh, you're catching a larger proportion of fish uh, than during the night. Uh, so the Richards model obviously is essentially a, a generalized logistic curve. So it's got a parameter for asymmetry. And so it can it have a little bit more flexibility in this GLM. Um, and you wouldn't necessarily expect the data here to, to meet this assumption of, uh, of symmetry. Um, now here I've uh, swapped out the, uh, the Richards model for a generalized additive model. Um, so this obviously uses a, a smoothing factor and it's actually a bit more uh, flexible. Uh, of, of, it's probably the more flexible of the, the, three, the three models I'm going to discuss here. Um, uh, and which you can kind of see where it deviates the most from the symmetrical model uh, at kind of at either ends. Um, and uh, this produces the, the lowest uh, AIC for the models, potentially suggesting that this produces the best uh, fit to the data. Um, although I faced some uncertainty over the, the most appropriate model, so that the statistical diagnostics and residuals uh, appear pretty similar. And although the GAN produces the lowest AIC, it's really not by very much. Uh, and the model is maybe not quite as nice to work with as the other models. So for the other models, uh, the, essentially the output is the, the equation and the numerical parameters. Over the GAM, it's got a smoothing factor for length, which got which has got to be stored and recalled uh, when you want to apply the model. Uh, although obviously this isn't really an, an insurmountable obstacle. 
Um, but I suppose it'd be very interested in any feedback concerning uh, other measures that I could consider for, for model selection, um, because really uh, when these estimates are applied to a stock estimate, um, the, the estimates that they produce for the, uh, the length uh, frequency distributions um, are, are very uh, similar. Um, so ultimately, uh, the use of these curves uh, results in a significant increase in abundance compared to uh, when you don't use these. Um, and an increase in biomass, albeit not significant, um, because these uh, smaller fish, they really don't weigh anywhere near as much as obviously the larger fish. Um, but I think that's all I've got time for. Uh, so thank you very much. Thank you, Rufus. Um, we don't really have much time for any questions just now, but if anyone has questions, they can ask it um, at the end. So I'll just call up Evanthea to go up next. Yes, hello. Hi, uh, I'm going to share my screen now. Uh, can you see my screen? The first. Uh, yes. Slide? Yeah. That's okay. perfect. So, whenever you're ready. Yeah. Hello, everyone. So, today I'm going to talk about a project on which I'm currently working for my PhD. The main motivation of my study is that often there is great uncertainty about tumor response to the cancer drugs. We know that patients' remission depends not only on the drug selection, but also on the drug dose that's administered, as well as the genetic makeup of a tumor, uh, which influences how it reacts to a drug. However, due to lack of predictive markers of tumor response, often all patients uh, receive the same therapy, resulting in high rates of treatment failure. We also know that genetic factors can help us not only select the optimal anti acid drug, but also fine-tune the dosage based on tumor characteristics. Uh, but statistical analysis for linking molecular markers with drug response becomes challenging due to high the high the high sorry, um, the high due to the high dimensional nature of the data. So my research aim was to examine the effect of genes on drug response over different drug dosages. So we actually, so here you can see an overview of uh, what I'm actually doing. So we had data from the uh, genomics of drug sensitivity in cancer project. So we have several cancer cell lines treated with uh, five anti-cancer drugs, along with uh, microarray gene expression. So actually genetic information on the cancer cell lines at baseline. Uh, we used uh, this data uh, to and we employ the those varying coefficient models along a two-stage variable selection algorithm. So the varying coefficient models actually we use it to allow for a very covariate effect over varying drug dosages, uh, and the two-stage alg algorithm including. Uh, included uh, mar two steps, uh, the marginal variable screening step, uh, which was following by a SCAD penalty step to identify the genetic components associated with the drug response. So by employing this method, we can actually obtain gene rankings for the selected genes uh, that we identify that are associated with the drug response. We are able also to obtain drug response predictions. So for a particular cell line and given her uh, its baseline characteristics, we can actually uh, predict uh, the drug response over different dosages. And we can also obtain an overview of the uh, dose varying effect of uh, the covariates that we uh, included in the model. These covariates can be, for example, uh, tumors, tumor characteristics like uh, cancer type or the exact uh, drug effect. Um, and that's the end of my talk. Uh, thank you very much. And if you have any questions, let me know. Thank you very much. We'll just give it a second to see if anyone chimes in with any questions. Okay. Okay. Well, in the meantime, you. yeah, thank you very much, Evanthia. Um, I'll just ask uh, Patrika's then to start getting ready. 
if you can hear me. Just, just opening the presentation. Okay, great. Just to double check, is it appearing on your screen? Yes, that's perfect. Thank you. Excellent. So my name is Patrick Asputinatris, and I'd like to present to you how to generate cell lines to efficiently uh, produce. Yes. Sorry, Patrick. Um, can I just ask if Adia to stop sharing her screen because we just swapped back to hers? Sorry about that. No worries. Evanthea, can you hear us? Sorry, yeah, uh, I'll, I, I, I should stop sharing my screen, sorry. Yes, yeah, <laughs> no okay. worries. Sorry. Okay. Sorry about that, okay, you're good to go. Uh, no worries. So essentially what we're trying to do is just produce cell lines that okay. actually produce a protein of choice to a very high level. Now, whichever way you do it, either in a large scale bioreactor or a small bench scale, the recipe is pretty simple. You take a bunch of cells and you put DNA into those cells. Now that way you create a lot of different cell types. You try to find just the right cell that you can then grow up and extract, purify or produce the protein of choice. However, there's a lot of issues with this method. First of all, when you insert DNA into these cells, they do not always take up the DNA. Sometimes there's fragmentation, there's the DNA breaks in half and only a certain part of it inserts. So therefore, on the genetic level, it's very difficult to predict. Then we look at the actual protein level, how we express that protein and find that the expression varies extremely highly. That is, some cells are very good, some cells are very bad at producing it, and it's very hard to predict. And on top of that, we also have epigenetic silencing, where we can use different promoters. We can use viral promoters or cells native promoters to kind of circumvent the silencing and at the still the cells still suppress that expression what if we could generate a cell line that had this this cassette this landing site where we know that it produces it very well to high to stable level and then using a simple one step reaction we could replace it with our favorite gene for example a vaccine for a virus or an antibody therapy and produce that to a high level for that we'd need to upgrade our recipe so with thick cells, we'd integrate that cassette. We then select cells that are actually very good at producing a protein. And then using a single one-step reaction, we turn all those cells into this massive factory for drug production. However, there's issues with that. Would you use high voltage, low voltage, or chemical means to put the DNA in? What about the selection process? Do you use one stage or a two-stage approach? What about the age of the cell line or epigenetic silencing? What's worrisome is all of these factors interact. Therefore, we set up a four-way generalized linear model to dissect exactly the best way to produce a cell line. Using multiple repeats, we managed to find that one specific condition, that is stage one, using a very high voltage, produces the best cell line for producing foreign proteins. Then, using our industry collaborators, we managed to show that that cell line is indeed better than the current industry standards because we managed to produce far more protein than they were capable using their cells. Therefore, validating that this particular way to generate these cell lines is the best approach for drug production. And with that, I welcome any questions that you may have. Great, thank you very much. Uh, do you, you have a question from David? Um, do you have mm -hmm. any idea why that method is the best? Yes, certainly. So first of all, what we find is that, as mentioned before, the DNA tends to fragment and insert into multiple bits, often multiple times. So therefore, stage one is better because there's more landing sites present in the genome. And interestingly, even though they are present at the higher copy number, they seem to avoid epigenetic silencing more. We suspect that it's because some of those sites are in a specific location that's very good. Secondly, the voltage conditions using to deliver DNA, they affect the amount of DNA that enters the cell, therefore affecting the integration pattern. That is, 
if there are multiple repeats in the same locus or if there are multiple loci targeted or if there's more copies of the DNA present, therefore affecting what sort of cell line we generate in the end. Great, thank you very much. That was very interesting. Um, now I'm just going to call up our last but not least speaker, um, Yorio, to the screen. Um, hello. Hi. Uh, let give me one moment. Yes, take your time. Uh, uh, can you see my PDF? Yes. Yeah, we can. Okay, thank you. Uh, hello, thank you for being here. My name is Georgios Stagakis. I am a PhD student in Loughborough University and I will give a brief, pre a brief presentation about layered Bayesian learning. Uh, the main problem that I work on is that I have a materials lab for which I have scanning electron microscopy image data and I try to learn the density function of the material. In order to do that, I follow a two-step procedure. Uh, firstly, I invert the image data in order to learn a, a discretized form of the density function. And then, given this discretized form, and uh, assuming that the density function follows a Gaussian stochastic process, I can learn the material density in uh, relocations and intervals in an actual form, not in a discretized. In order to do the inversion, I assume that the material is divided into voxels and that in each voxel the density function is fixed. I use the, a deterministic model out of which I can simulate uh, how a, a, a SEM image data is constructed given a density function psi. I have a short uh, toy example for the needs of my presentation. I simulated 18 uh, image uh, data uh, knowing the density function uh, from which they were created and I will try to learn the density function and compare the results of the method. The image inversion is based on the probability of the density in each voxel given the image data. In order to do the inversion, I sample uh, from this probability using the metropolis hastings algorithm. Uh, doing uh, the previous step, I have information for the material density in each uh, voxel the material slab was divided into. Uh, given this information as data again, I assume that the density function, as I mentioned before, follows a Gaussian stochastic process. And uh, through this modeling, I can learn the density function in intervals and not in a discretized form. In this slide, I have two counterplots of the same area of the material. It's an XZ representation. In uh, white, yellow, and red colors, you can see the true values for the of the density function out of which the image data were simulated by. And with uh, thick lines, I have replotted the results of the learning. In the right counterplot with blue lines, I have replotted the uh, learning results of the discretized form. And with black lines, the learning of the, the means of the Gaussian stochastic process given information from surrounding voxels. Closing, I would like to mention that I currently work on applying the method in real SCM image data. I work on with nuclear graphite and cadmium telluride materials. Thank you. Okay, thank you very, very much, Yorio. Uh, we have, um, we still have quite a couple of minutes for questions, so now is the time if anyone has anything to ask. And if anyone had any questions for any of the previous speakers, now would be a good time to ask them in the chat as well. And I'm sure they'd be happy to be pulled back up onto the screen to answer um, any of them.
Um, so I would like to ask a question, uh, Yorio, since we're not having any questions in the chat just now. Um, you mentioned on your last slide that you're applying this to graphite. Um, so what is sort of the end aim of looking at graphite? What is the sort of applicability of that? Uh, there are many applications. Uh, from what I know, that know, uh, knowing the structure of nuclear graphite is uh, 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 an open question of our time. Uh, many people work on this uh, through many different. Uh, 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 many people work on this uh, using many different techniques. Uh, it's a topic of interest in general. I know that nuclear graphite is usually used in. Uh, uh, atomic, uh, in atomic reactions in order to sustain the, the range of the reaction. Okay. That's, that's very interesting. I don't have any kind of background in that, so thank you for answering that question. Um, Adrian, Dr. Adrian Bowman has also um, mentioned in the comments that he wanted to say thank you to all the excellent talks, and I completely stand by that. These were really great and very interesting, so thank you to all of our presenters. Uh, we've got a short break now for 15 minutes, but then we'll be back for our, our, our second plenary talk. So this is time for everyone to go and get some refreshments and we'll be back at 12.15 to get started again.